Committee on Government Information, Justice and Agriculture took testimony today from two DEA officials concerning drug enforcement intelligence operations in Europe. This hearing of the Government Information, Justice and Agriculture Subcommittee come to order. Before we begin on the topic for today, I would just like to take a moment and remember a former director of this committee, Bill Jones, who passed away this weekend, a uh, very untimely death. And just to sit, reflect and remember that Bill gave this full committee much of its direction under Chairman Jack Brooks um, uh, for many years and then moved on to the Judiciary Committee when Chairman Brooks moved on. But many of us learned a lot uh, from Bill, uh, his patience and his uh, uh, quiet understanding. And what he did was to give us an institutional memory and an institutional presence that I think uh, carries on long beyond, beyond Bill or any of us. And so I'd just like to take this moment and reflect uh, uh, about Bill. Thank you. In accordance with Rules 10 and 11 of the House of Representatives, the Committee on Government Operations may conduct investigations into the functioning of federal departments and agencies and shall make recommendations to standing committees regarding necessary legislative changes. This subcommittee has delegated the responsibility of overseeing the Department of Justice. Congress has authorized the, DE, authorized the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, to conduct investigations into violations of federal drug trafficking laws. This involves identifying and investigating large-scale trafficking organizations, disrupting and dismantling their operations, as well as bringing drug traffickers and their accomplices to justice. On October 30th, 1990, the first in a series of news stories appeared alleging that a Drug Enforcement Administration operation targeting a Middle Eastern heroin smuggling network may have been infiltrated by terrorists responsible for the December 21st, 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. The aim of this operation was reportedly to trace and dismantle a heroin distribution network in Detroit and across the Midwest. According to press accounts based on multiple sources, individuals who knew and worked with DEA had a sophisticated system for transporting illicit cargo through Europe to the United States. The question is, could the terrorists responsible for the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 have utilized the same people or the same procedures as DEA? In its May 15, 1990 report, the President's Commission on Aviation Security and Terrorism concluded that there existed, and I quote, no foundation for speculation in press accounts that U.S. government officials had participated, tacitly or otherwise, in any supposed operation at Frankfurt Airport having anything to do with the sabotage of Flight 103. On December 4th, 1990, William Barr, the Deputy Attorney General, issued a press statement asserting that while the FBI's overall investigation is continuing, it had not found any evidence to substantiate the new allegation. Barr went on to say that the DEA had concluded its own internal inquiry and determined that its activities bore no connection to the destruction of Pan Am Flight 103. Notwithstanding the Presidential Commission's findings or statements made to date by the Justice Department, this subcommittee is intent upon examining exactly what DEA management did to investigate this allegation. People who have been close to DEA operations have suggested that rules and regulations governing sensitive undercover operations are not always in place, and sometimes things happen that are beyond the control and supervision of management, things that never get written up in a report to headquarters. We are here to explore if there, is, if there was an operation, and if so, whether it could have gotten out of control. I wa also want to point out that the second purpose of this hearing today, and possibly other hearings to follow, is that we are as interested in learning the breadth and scope of the DEA inquiry as we are in its findings. Nobody is accusing DEA of planting the bomb responsible for this tragedy. But the recent reports surrounding this allegation are serious. They raise a number of questions regarding DEA internal management practices and monitoring of operations. Depending on how these and other questions are answered, legislation may have to be enacted to address problems raised. 
I want to point out clearly for all to understand what this hearing is and is not. This hearing is not an investigation, an overall investigation into what happened to Pan Am Flight 103. This hearing is an investigation into allegations that were made concerning DEA's role and also is an investigation into the adequacy of the review process by which DEA was, has been uh, absolved in the process by which DEA performed its own internal investigation and other agencies performed an investigation of DEA's role. This has not been the easiest investigation for the subcommittee. I do not anticipate it, candidly, to get any easier. I do want to express my appreciation to DEA Administrator Bonner, who, feeling that DEA had performed an adequate internal review in the last, uh, last month or since these allegations arise, arose, was assertive in saying that DEA should come forward and tell its story. And DEA is, is before us today. I also want to express my appreciation to Mr. Westrake and Mr. Green, the witnesses today, who briefed uh, myself as well as members of the majority and minority staffs as to the results of the DEA investigation and have been, were very forthcoming in that meeting. I do want to express my disappointment, however, that despite repeated inquiries by this subcommittee to talk to the field agents who were involved in, this action, in these uh, uh, investigations and who were involved at the time of the Pan Am Flight 103, that the DEA and the Department of Justice have still not seen fit to make them available. I also want to express my disappointment that, as, at least as recently as yesterday evening, we had still not received the requested written information, particularly a closeout memo on the investigation from DEA. Concerning the FBI, whom we also invited to participate because the FBI was charged by the U.S. Attorney General following the allegations made in October about possible DEA uh, operation that could have resulted in the bomb being placed on Pan Am Flight 103. I want to note that the FBI to this date has been totally uncooperative, that they have been issued three invitations to appear. Mr. Sessions' name is placed at the table reflecting the fact that despite repeated invitations and at least one meeting with an FBI official and also a press release put out by the FBI saying that they had completed their investigation and found nothing to link the DEA to the Pan Am 103 bombing, they still refused to come to Congress to make that presentation. And so we leave that invitation open to the FBI. I would also note that the FBI did see fit on December the 4th through Mr. Barr to issue a press release stating that the DEA was not involved, but as I mentioned, is not willing to appear in front of the Congress to defend the investigation that went into that. We were told in a meeting in my office, in which majority and minority staff were present, by the legislative representative of the FBI that the investigation into the possible DEA involvement or the allegations concerning DEA were separate and apart from the ongoing DEA investigation into the Pan Am 103 bombing and that therefore those results could be made before, before the overall FBI report was made. That seemed reasonable. However, now we are told that the investigations are inextricable and that the FBI does not feel comfortable coming forward on the allegations concerning DEA until the overall investigation of the Pan Am 103 bombing uh, is concluded. The irony to that is that when we requested again for DEA field agents to be made available, we were told by Mr. Rawls of the Department of Justice in a letter of November the 15th that DEA agents could not be made available because this was part of an overall investigation. Yet at the same time, the FBI has concluded, and by press release at least, that there was no DEA involvement. If the DEA agents were not involved, why can't they be made available to this committee? The, the FBI has made, offered a briefing to me uh, within the last few days, which I have declined since the DEA had already provided a briefing of their internal investigation and the FBI was invited to be part of that. And quite frankly, I feel the time for briefings is over. That having announced that, the F, having announced that they've completed their investigation, it's time for the FBI to come forward and brief the Congress and the nation. The FBI has also offered to appear later. 
in front of this committee, sometime after January the 1st. Very convenient since this committee loses its jurisdiction. It does not become a, uh, a committee but since when the Congress uh, is adjourned and the Congress is out uh, uh, officially out on January the 2nd, a new Congress resumes and the Congress, the committee will have to reorganize. And so the FBI has offered to come forward sometime after that period. Very generous. Uh, we are going to give, assuming uh, the electorate has performed the first step in returning the members of the subcommittee to office, and assuming the caucuses, the respective caucuses of our party, the Democratic Caucus and the Republican Conference, in our full committee, put us back on this subcommittee, we will give the FBI that opportunity to come back. We will probably give others an opportunity also. But at this point, regrettably, it appears the FBI is not here. And I will just renew my invitation. Is there anyone here who's prepared to represent the FBI at this hearing? Let the record show uh, silence. Finally, in conclusion, uh, I once again note uh, the DEA is present, and we appreciate their presence here. Uh, as concerning the FBI, it is not enough to have ruled conclusively that a government agency might have, was not unknowingly involved in this tragic bombing. That agent, the FBI must also be willing to subject their investigation, as the DEA is willing apparently to subject its investi internal investigation to public scrutiny. So the, pr the loop will not be closed completely today. But we do appreciate your presence, uh, representatives of the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, to begin that process. Let me just make a note as to procedure. I have some questions that will require discussion of going into executive session pursuant to Rule 11. Uh, it is my, I anticipate that the DEA, and I believe you are represented also by counsel uh, from the Department of Justice, may raise some questions and requ re request that some of the questions addressed be conducted in executive session. It would be my intent that we would note those questions and flag them and try to handle all that we can in open session in one session. And then we would hold those questions and move into executive session at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the uh, questions that can be handled in open session. And therefore, those um, who might want to follow these proceedings, you don't need to, to wonder whether we're going to go in and out of executive session. We will try to handle it so that everything that can be done in open session will be done and then we will go into executive session. Uh, I now turn to Mr. Thomas, whom I greatly appreciate for being here, uh, for any opening comments he may wish to make. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here and want to commend you on your, on your work. As the nation prepares to mark a two-year anniversary of the tragedy of Pan Am 103, questions linger, apparently, as to what actually caused the accident. Who was responsible? How was the bomb placed on board? Where did the system fail, and how do we protect against future incidents. The answers to these questions are important to us all, of course. They're important to the traveling public, to the governmental agencies charged with ensuring aviation security, and most significantly are important to the families of those who lost their loved ones in the Pan Am disaster. The focus of today's hearing uh, is if the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency could have had any role in the downing of Pan Am 103 and I think uh, uh, the adequacy of the internal investigation of the agency. Immediately following the crash, certain press accounts mm -hmm. reported rumors of connections between the accident and an ongoing federal operation in the Frankfurt airport. Investigating these rumors, the President's Commission on Aviation Security and Terrorism could find no evidence of the linkage. Nevertheless, on October the 30th of this year, the media stories resurfaced, pinpointing DEA as the federal agency involved. Since that time, both the DEA and the FBI have conducted independent investigations into these allegations to determine their accuracy. We had hoped to hear from both of them today. Unfortunately, while DEA has completed its internal review and is anxious to speak with the committee, the FBI's investigation remains ongoing. And I think, Mr. Chairman, my information is it is not complete. They have completed that portion that has to do with DEA. But the investigation does continue, and they've declined this opportunity to to appear. In the meantime, I look forward to hearing from Mr. Westray and Mr. Green as to learn more of the internal review and the agency's relationship to the events surrounding this disaster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. At this point, I would request unanimous consent that a statement from Mrs. Collins, um, uh, Representative Collins, who has conducted 
hearings in an investigation into the overall Pan Am Flight 103 bombing be made a part of the record. I would also request the United's consent that a statement, a short statement submitted by uh, the victims of Pan Am Flight 103, Bert Ammerman, President, uh, be made a part of the record also. Uh, Mr. Westrate and Mr. Green, as you know, it's a practice of our subcommittee so as not to prejudice any witnesses who ever may appear before it to swear in all witnesses. Do you have any objections to that? Okay. If you'd stand and raise your right hand. You swear <coughs> to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. So. Mr. Green, you have a written statement I know that's been uh, uh, made a part of the records, and uh, so I would invite uh, both of you to, uh, to uh, testify in any matter that you see fit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a written statement, and I'd like to read this statement. Mr. Chairman, members of the Subcommittee on Government, Information, Justice, and Agriculture, I am pleased to have the opportunity to testify before you today concerning the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA's, alleged involvement in the tragic bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 on December 1988. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has primary jurisdiction over the ongoing criminal investigation into the bombing. DEA has no jurisdiction over the matter. Therefore, I cannot address the status of the criminal investigation. Instead, I am here today to put to rest the lingering allegations surfaced primarily in the media of DEA's alleged involvement in the bombing of Pan Am 103. I assure you that those allegations are unfounded and that DEA has no part in this terrible tragedy. On behalf of DEA, I would like to offer our sympathy to the families of the victims of Pan Am Flight 103. These recent allegations against DEA have just added to their grief. I want to clear the record today about the alleged role of DEA in this bombing, as much for the victims' families as for our agency. Some media accounts have speculated that the bomb that destroyed Pan Am 103 was smuggled on board in connection with an alleged DEA operation named Korea or Courier. According to the media accounts, the luggage that contained the bomb then bypassed security at the Frankfurt Airport. I can assure you that this allegation is not true. The scenario described by the media is completely incompatible with the way DEA operates overseas. Our overseas operations are conducted in complete accord with the laws of the host country in which we serve. Investigations overseas are coordinated with appropriate host country law enforcement officials on a case-by-case -case basis. DEA's operational policies and guidelines vary from country to country because they are dictated not only by U.S. law, but by the law, local laws and by the terms of our agreements with host countries. DEA has no arrangement with German law enforcement authorities or any other country under which luggage could be placed on board an aircraft while by bypassing applicable security measures. As a matter of policy, DEA does not conduct operations which circumvent airport security. Therefore, DEA would not have attempted to move drugs through a foreign airport without the knowledge of the host country's law enforcement officials and without compliance with applicable local security requirements. The suggestion that an informant or any other individual, because of an association with DEA, obtain the means or wherewithal to circumvent airport security is neither accurate nor plausible. The inconsistencies reported in the media accounts concerning DEA's established operating procedures are not the only evidence that suggests that DEA had no part in the Pan Am 103 tragedy. We have conducted an exhaustive internal interview which revealed that DEA had no ongoing investigation or operation in Europe during or immediately before December 1988 which even remotely resembled the one described in the media reports. There was no DEA operation named Korea or Courier or anything similar to that name. DEA had no operation under any name which facilitated the free movement of drug couriers from the Middle East or Cyprus through Frankfurt and onward toward London and the United States. And DEA had no operation which circumvented airport security at Frankfurt or for that matter any other city. To ensure the accuracy of our information, the administrator of DEA directed that an internal review team to, 
to interview DEA agents who were stationed in the concerned DEA offices during and immediately before December 1988. None of them had ever heard of the alleged operation described in the media reports, whether called Korea, Courier, or any other name. We also conducted an internal review of over 1,600 investigative case files that were opened in Europe and the United States during fiscal years 1984 to 1989 for any evidence of the alleged operation described in the media reports. This file revealed nothing even remotely resembling the alleged operation. During that entire period, DEA conducted only three investigations that involved the transit of drugs through Frankfurt, but none, of the, none was in December of 1988. All cases, however, excuse me, all cases were, however, conducted with complete cooperation of the German authorities and resulted in the arrest of important drug traffickers in the United States. Finally, the interview, the internal review team and selected DEA field offices interviewed a number of Middle Eastern informants who were either active in Europe during and around December 1988. The review team also carefully reviewed a number of active and inactive informant files to determine if any DEA informant had any connection to any of the persons mentioned in the media accounts. No connection was found. Media reports have also named various individuals as suspects in the Pan Am 103 bombing. DEA had no association with any of the individuals named by the media as suspect. Our internal review has also verified that no individual on Pan Am 103 passenger list, crew, was a DEA employee, informant, or source of information. None of the listed persons is on record of D in DEA files as ever having cooperated with or even being contacted by DEA. As a result of our internal review, I am confident in assuring this committee and the American public that DEA had no role in the tragic bombing of Pan Am 103. The FBI is, of course, primarily responsible for the investigation into this, that crime. And since the date of the bombing, DEA has given its full cooperation to the FBI and other international law enforcement authorities involved in the investigation. We will continue to do so. DEA shares the desire of the committee and the American public to see the terrorist who perpetrated this crime brought to justice. At this time, I would like to correct the apparent confusion in some media accounts over the investigative technique known as controlled delivery. Some media reports has identified the alleged DEA operation as a controlled delivery. As our internal investigation revealed, there was no such operation. But it is also important to make clear that the alleged operation described in the media accounts bears little resemblance to the controlled deliveries actually conducted by the DEA and other law enforcement agencies around the world. In a controlled delivery, a law enforcement agency monitors the shipment of contraband, including drugs, as it moves from a source or transit location to its intended destination. Use of this technique is sometimes essential to enable law enforcement agencies to identify and arrest high-ranking members of drug trafficking organizations in the recipient country, rather than simply arresting low-level couriers. The control delivery technique is not unique to DEA. The United Nations Convention on Illicit Drugs and Psychotropic Substances, which was signed by over 80 countries in December of 1988 and has since been ratified by the United States Senate and 20 more nations, subscribes to and supports the application of the controlled delivery technique. Interpol also endorses and encourages the use of this technique in narcotic investigations. While, con while the controlled delivery technique is highly useful, and sometimes essential to penetrating drug trafficking organizations. It is used by the international law enforcement community only under carefully controlled conditions. These types of deliveries are strictly controlled and supervised by law enforcement personnel at every stage. Controlled deliveries which cross international boundaries are coordinated in advance with law enforcement agencies in the countries involved. The cases resulting from controlled deliveries are prosecuted in federal court which allows for judicial review of our actions. Foreign officials often testify in U.S. court, and DEA personnel often testify in foreign judicial proceedings. 
I would therefore like to assure the committee that while DEA is continuing to employ the control delivery technique in investigations of international trafficking organizations, we do so only in a responsible and carefully controlled manner. In conclusion, I assure you that DEA has spared no expense of time, funds, and effort in our internal review of these allegations. I am confident that we left no stone unturned in the investigation of this incident. And our internal review clearly shows that DEA had no role in the Pan Am 103 tragedy. Mr. Chairman, my colleague, DEA Assistant Administrator for Planning and Inspection, David L. Westrate, who participated with me in DEA's internal review, is here with me today. We would be pleased to answer any questions you may have regarding my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Green. Mr. Westright, did you wish to add anything? Uh, no, sir. I want to once again express the appreciation of the subcommittee for both of you being here. Uh, Mr. Green is the Assistant Administrator for the Operations Division of the DEA, and Mr. Westright is the Assistant Administrator for Planning and Inspection of the DEA. Uh, the procedure that the subcommittee will use, since I know that I have a long list of questions and, and uh, Mr. Thomas may also, is that we will have uh, several rounds of questions and so we can go back and forth. That way uh, you don't have to bear with me all the way through nor, nor I with you and, and perhaps you'll be asking some of the questions I'd be asking and vice versa. Um, the first question I have is uh, simply to make sure it is clear on the record that the investigation performed by the DEA, the internal review, uh, is not in any way the investigation conducted by the FBI. Is that correct? That is correct. Ours is totally separate and it was an internal investigation conducted by DEA. And did, um, are there any common uh, sources of information in which material that you gleaned from your internal investigation went to the FBI without the FBI doing the interview themselves or doing the primary checking? I'm not uh, fully aware of the uh, breadth and scope of the FBI investigation. Uh, the FBI had access, access to uh, all the inquiries and all the DEA files and everything the DEA had on this matter. Mr. Westray, would you please tell us your current responsibilities as Assistant Administrator in charge of planning and inspection and describe your previous positions held at DEA? Uh, yes, sir. Prior to this uh, current position, I was Chief of Operations uh, for DEA or Assistant Administrator for Operations for approximately five years. What period was that? Um, from June of last year, uh, the prior five years. Uh, in June of this year, I was assigned to the uh, Assistant Administrator for Planning and Inspection. In this position, uh, in addition to the planning function for DEA, I am responsible for inspection of all of our offices, uh, <coughs> facilities and personnel, and also all of our Office of Professional Responsibility or, or OPR investigations. And so then do you oversee all OP or are you in charge of all OPR investigations? Uh, yes, sir, that's correct. Was this investigation that DEA performed an OPR investigation? Uh, no, it was not. It was a joint uh, inspection, uh, my division and the operations division review of this matter. Uh, it was done in the operational context. Uh, we did not believe we had a a viable allegation of wrongdoing to put it into the OPR context. Mr. Green, would you describe for us your duties both in your current position as Assistant Administrator for Operations and in your previous position as Deputy Assistant Administrator for Operations? Yes, my current position is Assistant Administrator for uh, Operations in the Drug Enforcement Administration, and in that position I oversee all of DEA's uh, investigative uh, and operational activity. My prior position of that was the deputy for that same office, so I was the deputy to uh, Mr. Westrate, who held the position of chief of our operations. <coughs> At this point, I would like to direct my questioning to either one of you, so please feel free to, to jump in. First, I want to focus on what DEA management may have done immediately after the tragedy upon learning of the destruction of Pan Am Flight 103 in December of 1988. Did you or others within DEA management instigate a review of any operations which may have involved the use of the Frankfurt or London airports? Uh, no, we did not uh, in institute a review, although we offered our cooperation to the FBI and other authorities as appropriate. 
It is my understanding that a staff investigator with the President's Commission on Aviation Security and Terrorism interviewed Mr. Richard Bly, the DEA Deputy Head of Intelligence. And at this point, I would request unanimous consent to enter a copy of the investigator's notes uh, taken at this interview into our hearing record. Uh, according to the investigator's notes, have you been supplied with a copy of those? Uh, yes, sir, we have. Uh, according to the investigator's notes on December 13, 1989, Mr. Bly stated that there was no DEA operation involving a Pan Am plane on December 21st, 1988. My first question is, would you tell us what Mr. Bly based his statement on? What specifically did he do and with whom did he check prior to making that statement? Uh, Mr. Chairman, he advises that um, this inquiry was based on some media allegations. Uh, I would point out that the interview with Mr. Bly was a year after uh, the actual crash. Uh, and uh, he advises that uh, he checked with uh, appropriate elements within the agency to see if there was any uh, such operation. And also, as chief of intelligence for DEA, uh, he would have been aware of anything ongoing of that nature. And uh, based on that, he responded to this interview. Specifically, whom did he check with? Uh, I would have to have you uh, follow up with you on that question to get a specific list. Okay. Uh, will the DEA supply us that list? Um, surely, absolutely. Okay. Um, now, I'm, I thought that in a previous meeting that we have had that I was told Mr. Bly was in charge of dispersing money for the purpose of setting up nets and subsources in the field. Does that describe his duties? Well, one of the functions in the intelligence office is to, um, to establish intelligence uh, networks or operations uh, and as such, he approves them, or his office and his staff approve them, and they also manage the finances and the results of those activities. Are you aware whether Mr. Bly checked with any of the agents who are presently in the field in the uh, areas in question, Germany or the Mideast or uh, other areas that, that uh, or Paris? We'd have to check on that for you, sir. And will you supply that information to Absolutely. the subcommittee? On December 21st, 1988, did any DEA operations utilize aircraft in or out of Frankfurt Airport? Uh, December 21st, 1988? Yes, Absolutely not. Your testimony, Mr. Green, referred to Pan Am Flight 103 and stated, I thought unequivocally, that there was no operation that day on Pan Am Flight 103. My question, uh, just so that we understand each other, my question goes to any flights uh, leaving uh, f uh, going through Frankfurt Airport. Uh, there were no operations on December 21st, 1988 out of Frankfurt Airport. Prior to December 21st, 1988, did any DEA operations use Pan Am passenger flights? Uh, our internal review shows uh, no record of, of Pan Am uh, Flight 103 ever being utilized by DEA. But I will say, and, and it will be a thread that runs through these, primarily when we conducted our interview, it was in response, our internal reviews, it was in response to very specific allegations, uh, which we brought in into 1,600 investigations. But the specific allegations were uh, that we got from the media that uh, DEA was involved in an overall operation targeted at Frankfurt Airport that specifically monitored movement of drugs from uh, the, the Syria, Lebanon, through Cyprus, through Frankfurt, on into Detroit, Michigan. Uh, in, in our review, as I stated before, in these 1,600 uh, cases that we see, we have only found three controlled deliveries that, uh, and these did not even match the, the scenario that was in the media allegations, but there were th only three controlled deliveries during this entire period out of the Frankfurt Airport, and I would be willing to discuss those with you. Would you uh, state what period that covers again? Uh, fiscal year 1984 through fiscal year 1989. And you're saying there were only three controlled deliveries? Out of the Frankfurt Airport. Out of Frankfurt Airport. And they did not, and these deliveries did not utilize uh, Pan Am aircraft. And when you say a controlled delivery, Mr. Green, are you referring to one specific flight being used? Or are you referring to an ongoing operation? No, I am, and I think it's, that's a very good question, sir. I am referring to a specific enforcement on, uh, case or a uh, specific incident. There was no operation targeted at uh, Frankfurt Airport. There was no broad operation targeted at uh, traffickers moving drugs out of uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, th through, through the Frankfurt Airport into the United States.
And do I also understand your testimony to be that prior to December 21st, 1988, that the DEA, at least for the five-year period you were referencing, did not use any Pan Am flights out of Frankfurt Airport uh, for any controlled delivery? I have uncovered no information that we used Pan Am flights in controlled deliveries. Were there any operations other than DEA operations, other than controlled deliveries that could have taken, that would have taken place uh, on the or at Frankfurt Airport uh, within that five-year period? Uh, none to my knowledge, including any by any, by any other uh, U.S. government uh, agency. Did you specifically investigate that? No, we did not. We, we uh, restricted our, in, our internal inquiry to strictly uh, uh, DEA. Now, prior to December 21st, 1988, you have testified that DEA did conduct three controlled delivery operations uh, out of the Frankfurt Airport. Uh, if, uh, in that case, then, what carriers were used? Any problem with this in open? Uh, the one controlled delivery occurred in 1987, and it went from Lebanon, Cyprus, Frankfurt, New York, on to Cleveland. Uh, the special, uh, there were special agents controlling the, uh, the contraband. The contraband was tested. Uh, it was always under our control, and the, uh, the method of entry into the United States was Transworld Airlines. Let me interrupt. When you say a special agent was controlling, does that mean a special agent accompanied that contraband the whole flight? Yes, sir. So he, he or she was on the plane while that was in transit. Fine, yes. if, you, if you would continue. The other incident, which again I remind you does not match the scenario, but are we, uh, we're going back to controlled deliveries. Uh, is where uh, individuals were arrested in Frankfurt by German authorities. The German authorities notified DEA that the, the arrested individuals had intended to bring the drugs to the United States. Uh, they were cold hits. Uh, specifically, one of them was in 1983. The drugs eventually went, uh, we uh, entered into the investigation. Uh, we uh, transported those drugs, which had been tested by German authorities and by DEA in Frankfurt. Those drugs eventually went on to Frankfurt, to Chicago uh, via Lufthansa, Chicago to Detroit via American Airlines, Detroit to Toledo via automobile. In Toledo, there was a delivery and arrest made. And then the uh, third one was in May of 1987. Again, this did not match the scenario or allegations. But this is where Syrians were detained at Frankfurt Airport in possessions of, possession of heroin. Uh, the German authorities contacted DEA when they found out that these drugs were intended for the United States. The, the method into Frankfurt was, was Lufthansa Airline. It was a cold hit. And the drugs eventually then went on to uh, Frankfurt, to Boston. Uh, aboard of Lufthansa flight, uh, and arrests were made. There was no. We found no indication of any control deliveries in 1988. If, any, if, if uh, you've testified that flights were used out of Frankfurt Airport uh, three during a five-year period, uh, can you describe for us the security measures taken at the airport to ensure that controlled narcotics were being loaded and not bombs or weapons? Or is there a procedure in place for determining that? Well, Mr. Congressman, I go back to my uh, uh, statement that when you do a controlled delivery, it is just that. Is it is controlled. The, uh, the sources of information, or in, in these two instances, they, these were arrested defendants. Uh, the, the substances were taken from these defendants. The substance, if, for these people to become defendants, the substance had to be tested and found to be uh, uh, a controlled substance, in this case, heroin. Uh, law enforcement authorities were brought back into uh, uh, the investigation at this point. Uh, he was DEA, and I, uh, I can look at those cases again. I believe even some of these German authorities uh, uh, went with these drugs back on. They are not, uh, you don't have an instance of a uh, substances uh, in suitcases being placed in whole baggage without going through airport security. There is not a uh, circumvention of airport security. That is why they are controlled deliveries.
Let me go back. Uh, you had testified that there were th other carriers used. Uh, I thought I heard you to say not Pan Am. Uh, out of through Frankfurt Airport, have you used Pan Am at any time? Uh, our review showed that no instances of us using Pan Am in a control delivery out of Frankfurt. On December 21st, 1988, did DEA have any active monitoring operations at the Frankfurt Airport? Uh, to my knowledge, no. If not, how can you be sure of the fact that nothing was going on uh, narcotics-wise at that time? I didn't say nothing was going on narcotic-wise. Uh, what I said is we did not have operations, a operation, directed at the movement of heroin through the Frankfurt Airport. There was not an ongoing operation. We have agents assigned both in Frankfurt and Bonn, and they uh, are uh, frequently at the airport doing business with uh, German Customs Authority, German police authorities that would have them in and out of that airport. But specifically, Congressman, we're addressing that there was a specific operation targeted at Middle Eastern heroin that, that was directed uh, at the Frankfurt Airport in monitoring the movement of, of uh, heroin through uh, into and out of the Frankfurt Airport. There was no operation such as that. Did you monitor any, any smugglers that may have been moving drugs through the Frankfurt Airport? No. Separate from a controlled delivery no. operation? So on December 21st, 1988, 1988, you were not, mo DEA was not monitoring any kind of narcotics movement through the Frankfurt Airport? No, sir. Does DEA work with the German authorities at that airport to monitor suspicious activity? We work with uh, German authorities, but we are not on a daily. We're not at the Frankfurt Airport on a regular or daily basis monitoring activity through that airport. No. At this time, I'll turn to Mr. Thomas uh, for any for questions he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me go back to just to one. Uh, you indicated there had been three controlled substance deliveries made through Frankfurt. Yes, sir. I believe your original statement said two. Is that, did you find another uh, or? No, sir, in my statement, uh, hopefully, I meant to say three, and hopefully I did say three. <laughs> the material you provided, I think, earlier said two. Um, you have indicated clearly um, that the AE had no part in this terrible tragedy. Uh, why do you think this inquiry goes forward? What, what you know, do, uh, do we don't understand what no means or what, uh, what is it? Well, hopefully that these allegations will be put to rest in terms of any DEA involvement in this matter. Uh, it is certainly, though, a, a serious allegation. Uh, that allegation we, by whom? By, primarily by the media. I see. And uh, we do not believe, uh, based on our investigation, we had anything to do with this. Uh, we're firm about it. We've been thorough about it. And hopefully that'll put this uh, hearing will put that to rest. Well, isn't this, in fact, the second investigation that you've made? Well, uh, I believe you're referencing the activity a year ago, the interview yes. of Mr. Bly. Well, right. th those, uh, those inquiries were not nearly as exhaustive as we've done uh, this time. But you have reacted then twice to media statements with respect to the EA involvement. Uh, yes, Mr. Congressman, we have, and uh, I think uh, what we responded to a year ago was accurate then, and it continues to be accurate today. Mm. And the, and the, it's my understanding that even though the FBI has not chosen to appear here, they have issued a statement saying that, in their view, DEA was not involved. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Would it be possible for an external non-governmental organization to do a complete investigation of your agency? Such as? From the outside. I, th I think the Barron's article had primarily was based on investigation done by some private organization. I'm inquiring as to what kind of an investigation they could make. No, sir. They absolutely could not do that because they would have no access to our files. They would have no access to our, our um, informant records, our personnel. Uh, there's uh, a whole series of laws and policies that would prohibit such a thing. The, um, I guess one of the, the really basic issue is whether or not uh, there was a, um, some sort of a bypassing of security measures. And uh, you indicate, of course, that your policy does not 
uh, does not provide for any bypassing. Is it possible that people work outside your policy in your agency? I think the, the uh, issue here in terms of someone utilizing something that had been established officially for an offline activity uh, is not plausible. And the reason it's not plausible, as Mr. Green has described, when we do engage in uh, a controlled delivery internationally, that activity is pre-cleared with law enforcement agencies. Oftentimes it is pre-cleared with custom services. Uh, it is almost always pre-cleared with prosecutors, uh, both here and in foreign countries. Uh, our activities are reviewed in court proceedings after the fact. Uh, it is not possible for a citizen to duplicate that by just uh, trying to do things at an airport. There's no, there would be no law enforcement personnel to meet the person. Uh, or do any of the procedures that uh, we go through. So I just don't think it's possible for someone to do that. Had there been, uh, if we had used in these operations, say, some kind of an arrangement to switch luggage or something like that, then you might, uh, you might assume that someone could do that if they had all the personnel in the airport lined up. Mm -hmm. But it just couldn't possibly happen. Well, the operative word maybe is pre-cleared. Is it possible, and it has happened, where people in an agency do not adhere to policy? No, it isn't, because... Um, the reason these things are pre-cleared and so on is we're dealing with contraband. And you just do not circumvent the laws of, of uh, these nations. There's two fundamental principles in drug law enforcement, the first being that we do not uh, lose contraband into the system. It's all controlled when we have uh, control and possession of it. And secondly, we do not do things unilaterally in foreign countries. We abide by their laws and regulations. So these are fairly elaborate activities with uh, prior uh, communications and, and uh, and uh, reports and cable traffic between embassies and so on. So uh, I just cannot see how someone could have uh, used a, quote, system that DEA had set up to circumvent uh, the activities at Frankfurt. It just does not make sense. But certainly it applies to everyone, but self-analysis is seldom critical. You look at yourself and your own agency in this instance. Did the uh, President's Commission conduct its own inquiries, or did they rely upon the inquiry conducted internally by the DEA? Well, sir, they conducted interviews uh, of uh, a few DEA personnel, but I would have to say that they didn't go into this in depth, and I think probably for the same reasons it did not appear to be a plausible uh, avenue of pursuit to them. It's they my did not my go into it in depth, then. No, sir, but I, my speculation is because, again, it didn't seem to be a plausible uh, scenario. Who generally, whom did they interview? Did they interview persons like yourselves who were supervisors? Did they interview people on the, uh, on the scene, international customs and enforcement officers? My understanding is, pertains to DEA, they interviewed the administrator, Mr. Lawn, uh, Mr. Bly, you've seen that memorandum, and also uh, Mr. Everett in the intelligence office, and the thrust of that uh, interview had to do with how DEA handled and managed uh, terrorism allegations that we received. How do we transmit that type of information? Uh, to appropriate agencies because that is outside of the scope of uh, DEA's jurisdiction. When you conducted the second round of investigations, how did that differ from the first round? Did you just do the same dance again or did you do something differently? No, sir. We did a bottoms-up review of uh, bottoms up. everything in every investigative file. As Mr. Green has testified, we've reviewed 1,600. It's actually probably closer to 1,800. Uh, investigative files, informant files, to see if we could find any activity at all that would come close to matching this type of a pattern. We reviewed files uh, originating in the New York office. That was more thorough than, than your initial investigation. Yeah, absolutely it was, yes. How did you determine no one aboard Pan Am 103 had any connection with DEA? Well, we cooperated with the Bureau um, in since the inception of their investigation uh, at the time of the crash. Uh, we have reviewed everything now, the passenger list, uh, the manifests through all of our record systems, and uh, the, s the same conclusion holds. There are witnesses, as you know, maybe this, it, who c claim that a, a person who came to your office a number of times was also on the airplane, Jafar. That is untrue. We have absolutely no record, either written or through our interviews, to establish uh, Mr. Jafar's uh, presence at any DEA facility, uh, nor any prior association with uh, Mr. Jafar in any way, shape, or form. See, thank you. Mr. Thomas, I might just add one thing on the second, as we call it, the inquiry 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the first time the Commission came over and talked to us. After uh, October, I believe, 28th, 29th, and 30th, we had very specific allegations put on uh, national TV uh, listing names of people, names of Mr. Jafar. They had uh, very bold statements that uh, here's specific trafficking routes, that this man uh, had curried drugs for the Drug Enforcement Administration, a whole series of allegations, very specific. That was the first time that we had any specific allegation, and that's what caused us. It wasn't like that. I don't want to leave the impression that in 19, uh, earlier in 1989, we were faced with this same thing, and uh, had uh, the head of our intelligence just simply provide an answer. Uh, it was when we got these allegations and saw them two nights on it that uh, we we uh, went through a responsible, uh, more in-depth uh, inquiry. I see. This then apparently has been resurrected to some degree in the media more recently, maybe even yesterday. Is there anything new in those allegations that differ, differ from your investigation basis? There, there is nothing new that's been raised in those allegations, uh, although I'm having difficulty keeping up with them. Uh, there's nothing new that's been raised in these allegations that changes any of the statements I've made to you specifically about our involvement on Pan Am 103 on, de on December 21st, 1988. Nothing. Thank you. Mr. Westrader, Mr. Green, I believe that one of you stated earlier, and I'm going to re-ask re the question, um, would you characterize your internal inquiry as an Office of Professional Responsibility investigation or something else? Well, it was a cooperative effort, personnel from uh, the Planning and Inspection Division and personnel from the Operations Division participated in this review. It has been characterized uh, by us officially as a review by the Operations Division. Uh, we specifically did not make it an OPR issue because we do not believe we have uh, a viable allegation of wrongdoing here. And uh, although uh, it was done in operations, we did have personnel from both divisions participate. You also said that, I think you used the words, that you did not see, view this as a plausible scenario uh, when confronted with it in, in before in beginning this new internal inquiry. My question is, doesn't that mean, uh, or does this mean that this was not a thorough inquiry, uh, but rather a way to mollify public concern. If you didn't think it was a viable allegation, uh, you've been down the road, you thought, uh, once before uh, with the President's Commission, and now you're confronted with this, you don't even make it the status of an OPR investigation. Uh, what, was the what was the purpose of this inquiry? And, and as I say, was it simply to assure public concern or to mollify public concern? Well, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that first of all, the review that was conducted uh, a year ago, uh, the, the media allegations at that time, as I recall, having read all of this, was focused more uh, on allegations about CIA and Frankfurt Airport, not DEA. <coughs> so I think you got a totally different set of allegations, first of all. As Mr. Green has just pointed out, the allegations currently under discussion are very specific. If you watch those TV programs, they've got graphics, they've got uh, specific names of people, names of, of uh, alleged uh, uh, police undercover operations, uh, names of people, and uh, passenger on the aircraft, and so forth. And uh, we felt with those details that we better look in great detail to satisfy ourselves, first of all, the public, the Congress, and everyone else, and be certain now that had we done something wrong, we certainly would have wanted to surface that as well. But uh, Well, I see this in the DEA's investigation in two stages. There was first the stage following the crash and when the President's Commission was compiling its report and Mr. Bly was interviewed and another gentleman from DEA, Mr. Everett, was that? Doug Everett, yes. Doug sir. Everett. Uh, that, and, then, and so that was concluded and the President's Commission concludes uh, that they didn't find any, any uh, evidence that there could have been a DEA involvement. Then come the allegations in October of this year, and DEA now launches this new internal inquiry, not an OPR inquiry, but an internal inquiry. And going back to the first stage, that is the President's Commission uh, stage, you've testified that Mr. Bly was interviewed and he talked to others. Uh, Mr. Everett was interviewed. In our subcommittee investigation, we've already introduced Mr. Bly's notes uh, that were taken into the file. In the archives, we find no evidence of notes taken concerning Mr. Everett's interview, so we don't know what he said. 
uh, or at least what he told the investigator. My question, though, you were head of operations, I believe, at the time, weren't you, that this, the President's Commission investigators were talking to DEA officials. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Were you, uh, did Mr. Bly talk to you about this uh, as he prepared the response to the President's Commission? Uh, I don't recall it, but my, my uh, opinion is that he would have been the appropriate person for them to be talking to in terms of any kind of an intelligence operation or program uh, at the Frankfurt Airport. But if there were a controlled delivery process going on or, quote, in operation, would not the director of operations been the person to talk to also? Uh, possibly, Mr. Chairman, but I think the point is there wasn't one, and so I don't think that there were a lot of uh, additional interviews conducted uh, by those investigators. But you'll have to go back uh, to the commission itself, perhaps, and, uh, and get some further details from their investigators as to why they may have or done certain things or not. I can't really speak to that personally. But if he didn't check with the director of operations, how did he know that there was not an operation going on? Well, because Mr. Bly, as chief of intelligence, reports to the director of operations, and anything that, uh, that I would have known, he also would have known and would have known in greater detail. So Mr. Bly then uh, it was under you? Yes. He, his, uh, in the Office of Intelligence is a subordinate element to the uh, operations uh, Assistant Administrator for Operations. So did he inform you that he was compiling this response then? I don't recall it, Mr. Chairman. Isn't it true that uh, agents, DEA agents, uh, don't always tell headquarters everything they're involved in because they're afraid of either compromising their operations or informants or perhaps they're doing something a little out of the ordinary? Mr. Wise, I would have to say that is not so. I mean, if somebody were to do that, it would be an absolute violation of regulations. Uh, they're not trained that way. They certainly cannot function that way. We do inspect uh, everything that we do. Uh, I would point out also that agents have an end product to deliver, and that is a completed investigation. And you cannot produce a completed investigation for, for prosecutorial review or a trial uh, by hiding things. Uh, I would also point out to you that, uh, that after the bombing itself, our offices in London and in Cyprus in particular were extremely supportive of the FBI investigation. In fact, uh, one of the victims on, on Pan Am 103 was a good friend of our agents in Cyprus, and they, they really uh, they described the detailed support they gave to the Bureau uh, after that uh, activity. And our country attaché in London in running DEA records for FBI uh, investigators after uh, the activity. We were aggressively trying to determine, for those reasons as well, what may have happened to that aircraft. You have permitted my staff to review a complex set of rules governing foreign and domestic operations contained in your agent's manuals. And I'm going to repeat the question again. You've answered it partly, but I want to make sure that we get this uh, for the record. How can you be sure that everyone is following these rules? Uh, as a former director of operations, present director of operations, Mr. Green, um, don't you, are you sometimes concerned that it's a long distance from Washington headquarters to field agents all over the world? Uh, Mr. Congressman, I, I think uh, there's a uh, degree of trust that's involved here. Uh, I trust our agents overseas to comply with our rules and regulations. Uh, do I ensure this trust? Uh, Mr. Westrage sometimes ensures it with uh, his inspections of these offices, the routine review of our investigative files, but I, I, I have to stress the importance of these controlled deliveries end up in a uh, the federal court system. Dur and during that process, the, uh, the, the entire uh, detail of this controlled delivery is fr from where, who owned these drugs, how did they get to the United States, who are the informants, uh, uh, who was involved in this investigation, who tested these drugs, all, all the things that are involved in a domestic uh, criminal investigation apply to these cases. So the judicial review, I mean, I, I don't rely on that for the trustworthiness of our agents, but that's just a, a check and balance. Y yes, I do rely on the trustworthiness of our agents over there. and that's, uh, do you feel that it's logical that agents who failed to file records, who might have failed to file requisite reports for whatever reason with headquarters would now come forward during an intensive internal review at headquarters? I don't understand why they would do that. In other words, uh, why would someone not file reports on an activity? It, it, uh, I suppose you could draw a conclusion that somebody might do such a thing and you're never a thousand percent certain on something like that. But what would be the end objective? In other words, a good narcotic agent conducting an investigation, if there is a, some kind of a load of drugs that's 
say, for example, is not controlled, we do not have inside control of it, and we were conducting surveillance of it, natural instincts would be to conduct surveillance of that activity to determine who else is involved in all of the traditional things we do in investigations. To not do that uh, makes no sense. And, and Mr. Wise, uh, I've tried to avoid this. It's, it's, try, it's, it's very difficult to, for me or Mr. Westray to, to take apart an impossible scenario. But if I could attempt to on the 21st of December 1988, uh, uh, to have an, a person aboard that aircraft doing a control delivery and then there was no DEA personnel aboard that aircraft, so it would give to the supposition that uh, we have somebody over there allowing an informant to do something with not under the control of an agent, not going with an agent, didn't happen, or there would have been an, an agent involved in this tragedy. Uh, people in New York would have been, a, you know, what would this uh, supposed person done with his drugs when he comes? The whole scenario is implausible. We would have had people needed to know along the, on the, along the way. We would have had people alerted to wherever this flight was coming into, wherever the ultimate destination was. And it's, uh, it's just an implausible scenario that, uh, that, that's, it's, as I said, it's, it's difficult to attack it, but uh, it's it just, uh, I am attacking it. Mr. Westright, during the period of 1986 to 1988, you were the assistant administrator in charge of operations, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And at that time, did you sit on the Undercover Operations Review Committee? Uh, that committee is actually chaired by the deputy uh, in operations, and I do not believe that committee existed in 1986. That is about a two-year-old uh, group. Did it exist in 1988? Uh, I'd have to check the exact dates, but probably. If it did exist so that we've got it for the record, does that mean that you would have reviewed all applications that would have come in from country attaches in Europe and the Middle East to undertake investigative operations or other activities in the Middle East? No, sir. A control delivery would not normally go through the sensitive and undercover review committee because they're not sensitive uh, in terms of daily activity within DEA. It is a routine activity that is ongoing continually worldwide by countries and law enforcement personnel involved in drug law enforcement. I suspect as we sit here this morning there's a controlled delivery or two occurring somewhere in the world uh, from Thailand or Pakistan or between uh, uh, two countries not involving the U.S. The purpose of our sensitive undercover review committee uh, is to monitor those activities which are considered extremely sensitive for uh, various reasons. Amounts of money involved in a particular case, the level of violator, uh, particular, a particularly dangerous uh, situation, perhaps uh, uh, a corruption aspect to a case, uh, perhaps uh, there's a number of, of reasons that are delineated as to why an activity would be uh, forwarded to um, that committee, for example, something sensitive uh, as a, a media person or a political figure that would be involved in an investigation. That is the type of thing that would come before this committee so that we have full and complete concurrence by the lawyers, the operators, uh, and the managers of DEA to proceed in, in the way that's established. Mr. Thomas, at this point, I'll, uh, I have another line of questions that I'll start. I'd like to turn to you. All right, sir. <coughs> Briefly. Um you indicated, I believe, that there were no uh, DEA <coughs> affiliated or associated persons on the plane. Do you know if there were other traffickers or mules aboard 103? Um, I would answer that question by saying in running the passenger list, uh, we did have a couple of positive hits, but I would not characterize those people as you have. Uh, if you'd like to get into that in closed session, because that's uh, in the area of raw intelligence, uh, raw investigative data, I could discuss it perhaps some in closed session. But I don't believe, uh, for the purposes of the hearing this morning, that that information is of significance. It is not, in my opinion, significant. And I believe that also was an associate of a passenger. Uh, there's, uh, back to my statement, there was no record of any of the passenger's crew uh, with DEA. A passenger had an associate that we're aware of, and we would gladly discuss that in uh, closed session. Sure. Of course, thank you. Uh, let me just clarify. Um, did you you indicated when we talked about uh, control of the transportation of of uh, of um, 
materials. Are they hand carried always in these uh, in these um, security shipments that you have? Uh, as opposed to being checked in baggage? You have to look at the type of activity ongoing. A controlled delivery can occur with uh, a, a ton of cocaine, for example, in a private aircraft, uh, or 50 tons of marijuana in a ship. Uh, in, so you don't it, have airport security on those two instances. No, of so there's, you know, the controlled delivery issue itself can be much broader. But commercial in, airlines. In terms of is. commercial airlines, the bags are controlled. If it's uh, something concealed, for example, in the false sides of a suitcase, that would probably... Uh, proceed on after examination and all that in the hold of an aircraft and be taken off uh, under controlled circumstances at the destination. Oftentimes, though, in heroin cases in particular, uh, that type of drug is carried in a small uh, bag or suitcase uh, type thing, that uh, carry-on luggage. But a controlled, in a controlled carrying situation, it could be checked baggage then. Is that what you're saying? Could be, yes. I see. Um, I guess I'm still much interested in and in, in what prompts this issue to continue to surface from time to time. There, if there was a private organization investigating this, who would have caused them? Who would pay them? I think the investigation you have reference to is one that was uh, done on behalf of Pan Am. I see. What, uh, tell me what Pan Am's interest would be in, in having an investigation. Well, sir, I'd be hard put to speculate on what Pan Am's uh, motivation is in the investigation. Obviously, they've got a lot of litigation and so forth going on. And perhaps that question should be directed at them. I think you've answered it. Um, what, um, are you aware of the identity of individuals who have been the source of recent ones? Um, I think writing a book or, or something, isn't there? I think we have an understanding of who most of the sources are for various people, yes. Would you care to share that? I couldn't speculate in an open hearing as to uh, people's motivations. I just don't have personal knowledge. Well, that's not a motivation. Where does the information come from, in your view, or, or if you aren't free to say so? Um, I would only go so far as to say that I think uh, there are a number of different sources, who, most of whom, in my opinion, are speculating. Uh, as to the scenario involved in this plane crash also. I think there's an awful lot of speculating going on by people for various reasons. I see. I have no further questions right now. I would like to talk some now about the DEA team that conducted the recent internal review, not the, the uh, President's Commission response, but the recent review since October. Can you tell us the names and positions held of those DEA agents and the officials who comprise a team of DEA investigators handling this matter? Uh, we could provide that for the record, sir, yes. And how were these individuals selected for the task? Um, some because of uh, subject matter expertise. Uh, for example, one of the intelligence analysts uh, is a true expert uh, in the entire issue of Mideast heroin. And because of, uh, of her work over the years in this area, she's uh, virtually uh, intimately familiar with many of the major, most of the major investigations, most of the major players, most of the major sources of information, and certainly uh, the various uh, programs that we have ongoing. Uh, others were selected because of uh, a particular position that they held within the organization, uh, such as the deputy uh, director of the special agent, who is the deputy uh, office chief for the heroin, uh, the office of uh, heroin and DEA. Did any of the individuals on, and let's, if, if you have no objection, I'll just refer to it as a task force. Uh, did any of the individuals on this task force presently serve in Europe, the Middle East, or the heroin desk from 1985 to 1988? I'd have to review the list, but uh, certainly those who had served were part, of, uh, were part of the folks interviewed for this, so probably we wouldn't have put those to be interviewed on, on the, the task force itself. But we certainly did try and get some folks with uh, international experience. Could there, that's, Leading up to my next question is, if there were individuals on the task force, um, and I would ask, I would request that when you submit the list of names of those who, who did perform the investigation, if you could also indicate whether they did serve in Europe, the Middle East, or the heroin deaths from 1985 to 1988. My question is, if there are any such individuals, would they have had a conflict of interest um, to have been DEA employees who served during this period 
and in the region in question, and at the same time performing an internal inquiry into this matter? Yeah, presumably they would have, but I don't believe we have that situation. Were informants interviewed in connection with your recent internal inquiry? Uh, yes, they were. And are you prepared to tell the subcommittee their names in an executive session? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that's uh, the answer to that would probably be no, but I would have to consult through the chain of command and with the department on that issue. Uh, certainly, if you made such a request, we would uh, try and deal with it as best we could. I'm still waiting to talk to some of the field agents, too, uh, under the headings of request. I'll see how far we've gotten there. We, uh, we would, uh, and I think we've already stated it, though, just so there's no, that the one individual whose name keeps surfacing, Jafar, is not an informant or never was an informant of the DEA. And that's well, that gets into my next question, is how about subsources? And w perhaps some instruction would be helpful to me. As I understand the hierarchy um, within DEA, uh, that you have, obviously, DEA agents on the DEA payroll, um, uh, federal employees. You then have informants. Are informants, as a rule, paid by DEA? Yes, of course. And do they show up on vouchers or, or some sort of form uh, within DEA? Well, perhaps we should describe uh, very briefly to be an informant for the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, requires an elaborate uh, paperwork uh, trail. Fingerprints, photographs, record checks, criminal record checks, um, supervisory interviews, debriefing reports, um, and it is not something that people just wander in and out of. It is an accountable activity. Uh, it is, uh, frankly, an activity that is a difficult one to manage in that uh, a lot of uh, these people have different motivations. Some are criminal defendants. Uh, others are just, we describe them as walk-ins. Oftentimes these people have motivations that we have to sort out. They're, they're uh, revenge-oriented or uh, some of them are just strictly very patriotic and want to help. So you have to sort through all of this and that's what our expertise uh, is. The issue of, of subsources, uh, I think uh, it is obvious to everyone that a person out there gathering information on behalf of an agency and then reporting it to that agency has to talk to people and gather information. And uh, if you want to refer to them as subsources or not, I think you get into a question of one, do they know whether or not the person they're talking to is in fact an informant working for the government? Uh, some do and some don't, more often not. Uh, you have to look also at, at uh, where it is we are trying to gather information. For example, we are not physically present in Syria and Lebanon, yet we have a tremendous need to know information from there as to things on a strategic level, such as opium production. Is it up or down this year? What's the weather been like? That type of thing. And then you get into the, the other end of the spectrum, which is actual conduct of criminal investigations, the potential for court testimony on the part of the source, witness protection, in all of those issues. I do not believe that the subsource issue is a valid one in the context of the Pan Am 103 case because a controlled delivery is not something that involves subsources. If we are going to be moving a controlled delivery through the international system uh, to a, an arrest situation like Mr. Green described in uh, Toledo, for example, that is done by someone who is documented, known to us, fingerprinted, photographed, and most likely will be expected to testify on the, other, on, on the uh, court proceedings, perhaps in both countries, because they are an actual uh, person who is involved in the commission of the crime, not just providing information, but actually involved conversations, probably uh, tape-recorded conversations on the phone, perhaps uh, some of the other techniques for... for um, uh, audio and visual recording of these events. So the notion that a subsource could somehow have been working for, say, Mr. Jafar on that aircraft or someone else and uh, got into a duping situation and moving drugs to the airport is, again, not plausible. Well, the, so informants are known to DEA because you've investigated them. Subsources are not necessarily known to official DEA. I would say most generally not. And you mentioned Mr. Jafar. Uh, as I understand your testimony, Mr. Jafar was not an informant of the DEA. That is correct. He was not. Uh, can you state whether he was 
categorically whether or not he was a subsource. We have done a very thorough look at this, and it is our opinion, it is our conclusion that he was not an informant, certainly, and a subsource, and nor do we have any information that would indicate that uh, he was operating in any way in a situation in which he would have subsources for us. Uh, he's just simply not in our system in any way. Um, can you tell us the names of the agents who were interviewed during the course of your inquiry? Yes, sir, we could provide that for you. Primarily, it's country attaches uh, and uh, others who served in Europe at the time in question. Were agents and informants interviewed strictly by members of your task force, or did other agents and officials participate in these briefings? Well, we interviewed them ourselves, and then the FBI, we, we made uh, these folks uh, available to the FBI for interview by them independently, which was accomplished. Uh, many of these people, we had to fly to Washington to accomplish this, uh, which we did. And when they were interviewed by the FBI, were there any uh, other DEA personnel present besides the person being interviewed? I believe they did it uh, independently. When you say independently, you mean without? Without uh, other DEA persons present. Uh, do you have the names and positions of the non-task force members who participated? I'm not sure I know what you mean by non-task well, force members. you said that members. you thought that some of the agents might have been interviewed by others that were not DEA. Uh, I asked whether your agents, your agents were interviewed only by DEA personnel. You stated that, uh, oh. or did other agents and officials participate in these debriefings? Oh, I see what you mean. I believe, uh, I think uh, we probably talked to more people than the FBI did, uh, if that's what you mean. Can we make a list of those available? Yes, we can. Were any of the informants, well, let me ask you, did you interview any informants? Yes, we did. Did it, and you interviewed agents? Yes, sir. Were any of the informants and or agents interviewed administered a polygraph test? Uh, no, perhaps one. I'll have to check for sure. But as a general technique, no. Uh, will you provide the subcommittee a list of the reports on the results of any polygraph examination? Yes, sir. If we did conduct one, we will. And, we, and it's saying, it goes without saying that we, if you did not conduct any, if you would simply state that also. Sure. Um, isn't it true that polygraph examinations are routinely used during the course of an OPR investigation? Well, they're not routinely used in a sense they're always used. They are used on a selective basis as an investigative tool. Uh, we do not automatically subject DEA employees to polygraph examinations. In fact, a polygraph examination must be voluntary. You cannot force an employee to take one. Uh, a polygraph examination uh, is a useful technique often, but it is something that has to be professionally done. And uh, I think uh, in the context of our government, and the, the trust that we put in our, our people and the quality of people that we have on the job, uh, I just don't think a policy like uh, uh, broad use of polygraph would fly. I certainly wouldn't support that. Well, but given the gravity of this situation, uh, the gravity of the allegations, was a polygraph examination considered? Mr. Wise, I would say to you that had there had been some substance to these allegations, and we were proceeding down the road, say, towards a, a criminal conclusion on the part of some DEA employee. As you get down that type of a, of a road, then the use of a polygraph would come into play. But simply as a sorting technique or a screening technique, no. No agency does that in this country. And plus the Bureau, is, as Mr. Green uh, points out, had their investigation going on as well. Are you aware whether or not the Bureau performed any polygraph examinations? I don't believe they did. Okay. Mr. Westray, you referenced something again that, that those looking from outside would question, and I, uh, you said something about that not believing there was any substance to these allegations. That raises the implication that the decision was made before going into the investigation that there wasn't any substance to these investigations. And does that then tend to color the results of the investigation? If you start in saying, whoops, we've got this inquiry, it's causing a lot of problems, uh, let's do a quick investigation, and uh, we know nothing happened, but let's do the investigation anyway and issue a statement that nothing happened, doesn't that color the investigation? Well, Mr. Chairman, I will say this. We receive allegations all the time. 
as does any law enforcement uh, organization. And we all have OPR offices and that type of thing. I think we know how to handle an allegation. I don't think we prejudged them. I don't believe we did in this case. Uh, I think we were certainly considering the context <coughs> and the plausibility of the allegation. We always do that. Uh, so I think we went about this objectively. We're trying to prove a negative in a sense here. It's very difficult. And I would say this that if the networks who made these allegations have sources who can confirm with facts these allegations, I would ask, where are they? Let them bring them forward. I mean, we have a major national tragedy here uh, that deserves to be uh, fully reviewed, and I think we've done our level best uh, within DEA to pursue these allegations. Uh, I don't know what we could do further, uh, and it's time that uh, Perhaps if somebody has something of substance that uh, they bring it forward. If they don't have it, they should say so. Who is responsible for the overall supervision of the investigation? Uh, Mr. Green. In your opening statement, you, Mr. Green, you noted that 1,600 investigative case files from Europe and the United States were reviewed. Can you just discuss what exactly is an investigative case file? Uh, it is a file that uh, DEA believes that there is enough information to warrant the opening of a formal investigation, which hopefully would lead to a prosecution. Uh, I would uh, compare it to a general file, which is uh, very general in nature, uh, not on a specific individual or organization. And uh, we, we primarily just looked at, uh, I believe, almost every heroin investigation uh, that occurred in that part of the uh, world, focusing on the Middle East, Europe, uh, Frankfurt, uh, that involves something going on between the United States. Were any case files from your Cyprus office reviewed? All the case files from the Cyprus office were reviewed. Would you say that there could have been things going on in the Paris or Cyprus offices that you might not have been aware of? I personally or the team. Uh, Mr. Congressman, any, anything is possible. I go back to I must, I, I must rely on the fact that uh, if you're going to conduct an investigation, the purpose of conducting an investigation is uh, uh, hopefully somebody's going to be prosecuted. So you prepare the proper reports at the beginning of these things. The, these, these control deliveries do not occur in a vacuum with the paperwork occurring after and we fill in the blanks. Uh, initial contacts with uh, informants uh, are recorded uh, on the, the scenarios that I mentioned to you. Uh, the investigation would have probably on those started when there was arrest at the, uh, the, the Frankfurt Airport. So in, in answer specifically, uh, uh, I can only rely on the, uh, the, the professionalism and trustworthiness of our, the people we have assigned overseas, and I believe they'd uh, <laughs> properly report uh, their investigative activity. So are you satisfied, uh, particularly given since the time of the closing of your investigation, that this was an adequate investigation? Uh, more than satisfied. And do you have any concerns about the fact that uh, relevant uh, uh, persons were not polygraphed, simply interviewed? No, I'm not concerned with that at all. It's, uh, and, I, and, I, and I've never discounted these allegations, but uh, I go back into uh, the, the plausibility of them. Uh, no, I'm not concerned with that. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, as, as Mr. Westrade stated, had at any time the, uh, the Bureau indicated to us, or, uh, and I'm not saying they had to indicate, they are conducting their own investigation, that uh, they had DEA involvement on it, I'm, st I'm still confident they would proceed with that. Or, uh, so no, I'm not concerned that people weren't polygraphed on this. I have another line of questions that I'll defer. Mr. Thomas? I just, Mr. Chairman, have more of a... I agree with Mr. Westrate. This has been a major tragedy. Tragedy. It needs to be pursued until we find a satisfactory answer. But you all have had a presidential commission inquiring. You've done two investigations of your own, if I understand it correctly. The um, FBI is still uh, working on it and will continue to. And so uh, you've had a pretty thorough investigation, it would seem to me. We need to continue. But you have a tough job in a society that's open like ours to try to do the things that you you do. So I appreciate your openness and your willingness to, to be here and to deal with this question. Thank you very much. Following up on, on uh, Mr. Thomas's statement, um, is it your understanding, 
that in terms of the investigation as to whether there was any DEA uh, involvement in the Pan Am bombing, uh, is the FBI still investigating this, or have they closed this aspect of the investigation? My understanding is that they have uh, perhaps one more interview that they would like to conduct when they can reach, reach someone, but basically uh, my understanding is it's virtually concluded. And were you informed by the FBI before the uh, uh, public statement made by Mr. Barr on December the 4th that the FBI had uh, con effectively, I read it to have concluded the investigation, but at least the FBI was concluding that there was no DEA involvement. Mr. Barr's statement was cleared by the FBI. It was cleared by the FBI. Was it, were you made aware of it before it was issued? Absolutely. Um, when and how did passenger Jafar's name first come to your attention as a possible drug mule who might have been duped into carrying that, the bomb that destroyed uh, 103? Uh, I think we should defer that question. All right. I will defer another question also. Uh, did Mr. Jafar have, to your knowledge, have, or from your investigation, have any contact with any DEA offices? No, sir. Was he working in any capacity as a, for a DEA informant? No, he was not. And you can state... You mean as a subsource, for example? Yes. No, sir, he was not. To, and I say again, and I'm not, uh, to, to our knowledge, uh, and we've stated uh, before uh, that we, we cannot determine uh, who all subsources are or sub-subsources <coughs> are as an informant. So uh, I'm careful with a categoric deny that uh, any uh, uh, informant of the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration uh, we could not, we, we did not uh, uncover any contact between Jafar and these people, but uh, just to give you a categorical no, I don't know the size of the universe there. But did you, in your investigation, did you specifically ask DEA agents and informants? Yes, sir, whether the answer was no. And so did the DEA look specifically into whether Jafar was close to any of its, that is, the DEA's informants? And what did you find? We found no contact between DEA informants, uh, the informants that we were able to get to, uh, and Jafar. Have you looked into Mr. Jafar's background, family, uh, past, and what did you find? Uh, I'd like to defer that to our closed session. All right. Are you aware that Mr. Jafar reportedly made frequent trips to Lebanon from his home in Dearborn, Michigan? I'd like to defer that. Are you aware, uh, I'm deferring another question also. Are you aware of a company in Cyprus called Urami? Uh, yes, Spelled I am. E-U-R-A-M-E. Uh, yes, I am. Is this a company in which DEA has an interest? It was, it was a company that was set up by the uh, Cypriot law enforcement authorities uh, to use as a place to meet individuals it consisted of an apartment and a telephone and it was simply a place to meet people I am aware of it so it had a company name on it and can you describe the DEA's interest in this company uh, the Cypriot police made this uh, facility available and we occasionally used it to uh, meet individuals and uh, in an area outside of uh, the embassy. And anything further than that, I will tell you in closed session our exact uh, uh, involvement with this uh, facility. Are you aware of a company in Detroit called SEMCO, S-E-M-C-O, the Southeastern Michigan Con Corruption Operation? Uh, no, I'm not, but... Uh, no, I, I'm not. I mean. Uh, Specifically, no, I'm not, but... Uh, or, or are you aware, let me ask you simply about the letters, the acronym, S-E-M-C-O. Are you familiar with a company in Michigan, uh, or in Detroit, called SEMCO? Uh, no, sir, I'm not. Okay. Mr. Westrick? No, sir. You've already testified, I believe, but let me ask it again, were there any DEA agents or employees aboard Pan Am 103 on December 21st, 1988? No, sir. 
Did DEA have any operations from Lebanon in place on December 21st, 1988? Uh, operations from Lebanon inv involving uh, Pan Am 103? Yes. No, sir. What about any narcotics operations? Involving Pan Am 3? No, sir. No, but sir. What about if we leave out Pan Am 103? Uh, None on those dates. We'll return to that in executive session. Is it possible that an operation could have been going on without senior management at headquarters knowing about it? I don't want to give you the answer that anything's possible, but uh, the answer is no. It's, uh, I mean, if... I'd like to turn for a moment, let me just, did you want to get, okay. I'd like to turn for a moment to how DEA sets up operations and puts informants and subsources to work in the Middle East. Um, how do you select informants in the Middle East? I think we should cover this in an executive right. session, sir. I'm going to defer. I'm going to defer several other questions in the same vein. Now, isn't it a fact that one of the difficulties with undercover operations is that sources and informants always often try to cheat, uh, often might want to do some drug business on the side while at the same time assisting DEA? I mean, we're not dealing with uh, candidates for canonization here, I don't think, are we? That's a constant problem, yes, sir. Is there any kind of rule of thumb as to how long a person remains a DEA informant? Well, that would be controlled by their productivity, their effectiveness. Uh, oftentimes, as you can well imagine, if someone testifies, uh, their usefulness in a covert way is ended. Uh, so it depends on, a, again, an individual by individual basis. If an informant is in place for longer than a year, is there a how do they remain effective unless they're doing, unless they're involved in the narcotics business themselves? Well, it depends on, uh, on where they are and what they're doing and associations, what countries they're operational in, that type of thing. Uh, clearly, to be, to be a successful source of information on drug cases, like same of you were successful in bank robberies or bank fraud, you'd have to be involved with the people involved in those activities, so uh, they certainly are. If, as part of DEA procedure, if an, inform, or if an agent is told informally about drug transactions that the informant is involved in, is the agent required to investigate or to arrest the informant? Required to? Yes. Uh, well, you wouldn't arrest him on the spot, but you certainly would confer with the U.S. Attorney about that type of thing, uh, if, particularly if it's domestic. Uh, international would be a little more difficult. And being an informant, Mr. Congressman, gives no one the authority to violate any law. Returning to the, an earlier question is then, isn't it a, something you have to monitor all the time, the extent to which informants might try cheating, uh, and by selling drugs on, of their own, uh, separate and apart from DEA operations, or perhaps even under the auspices uh, or while, while working for DEA? That is correct, and I'm told in one of the cases that we did review, an informant was doing exactly that, uh, one for me and two for the government, and he was arrested and prosecuted in the U.S. I have another question that I will ask in executive session. I will ask that question in executive session. Um, I ask that question. Session. Several more that will be asked in executive session. Now, looking at how European airports might be used to facilitate a DEA narcotics investigation or operation, is it correct that London and Frankfurt are two major hubs in and out of Europe and that uh, they are looked at as major trafficking hubs? That's clearly the case, as would be JFK and LAX and uh, these major transportation centers. Paris and Amsterdam also. Do DEA operations transit these airports? You've spoken some about Frankfurt. What about the others? Yes, they do. In, in fact, the general consensus of the DEA personnel is that the 
the uh, Frankfurt Airport was one of the most complex to do a case through because of the way the prosecutors handled those cases in terms of, uh, of uh, the detail that they would go into. Can you s tell the subcommittee that apart from the three investigations or three operations that you noted in your opening statement, Mr. Green, uh, were there any undercover operations, not necessarily formal operations, resulting <coughs> excuse me, in narcotics being transited through Frankfurt and London? <laughs> what we reviewed is we we primarily we re, not primarily we did review investigations that came out of the Middle East, going through uh, Frankfurt on into the United States, and that's the ones I said out of the during that time period. The only thing we could find was uh, those three, uh, but but you would have uh, I mean it is as you said it is a hub airport. You may have uh, other arrests that. Uh, uh, occurred there uh, from Pakistan, India, other places where controlled substance. Uh, now occasionally the traffickers are moving heroin out of Southeast Asia through these points. Uh, uh, so, The three operations you referred to and what most of our discussion has centered about have been what's known as controlled deliveries. Yes. But does the DEA conduct in these operations a lesser type of operation, not as controlled, not as uh, uh, tightly monitored uh, in the sense of having an agent actually accompanying the the illegal substance all the way. But are there monitoring operations, for instance, that are being conducted through these operations? In other words, lesser operations being conducted in these uh, airports, particularly Frankfurt. I think, Mr. Chairman, the issue here is control. Yes, there are, there are obviously numerous DEA investigations uh, ongoing in cooperation with foreign governments worldwide about the smuggling of drugs. And oftentimes, say, from a wiretap investigation or informant information, we might know that a load is moving, uh, say, within a particular time frame. Um, and we will take what actions we can to determine where those drugs are. And depending on what's occurring, let's say we do locate them in, in transit at some airport, seize them, and then from that point move them forward in controlled circumstances, or perhaps just conduct surveillance or use other kinds of techniques that I, I really would can I get into here, but other technical means to ensure that once drugs are discovered that a control is placed upon them and that we try and move them as far as we can to to uh, enhance our investigation and get the true uh, kingpins or the true organizers behind this and not just a courier. And uh, yes, that activity is ongoing all the time. Can you say w that there have never been times when drugs have ever transited either airport in connection with a DEA activity when the local authorities have not known? No, sir, we don't do business that way. Uh, if there were some rare case, and certainly Europe is not uh, the area of the world where that, that might occur, but, uh, you know, sometimes, well, if you extend the particular discussion back to Syria and Lebanon, uh, we do not have any relationships really with those governments. So we might be aware of something going on that we can't coordinate there, but that's that's a matter of, of uh, the political situation and not not uh, law enforcement technique. I have a series of questions on the Mideast, but since you've indicated a sensitivity to that, I'm going to defer those uh, for executive session. For the years 1986, 1988, can you tell us the current positions of country attachés and their deputies who served in Cyprus, Paris, Frankfurt, and on the heroin desk at DEA headquarters? Yes, sir, we'd be glad to provide that for the record. Are any of these individuals now retired, to your knowledge? Uh, two or three. Would you note when you supply that for the record sure. who, is, who is retired? Absolutely. And when they retired? Uh, I'd like to also note, and I have actually noted previously to this, that um, we've requested that many of these individuals be made available for staff interviews prior to this hearing, and we've been consistently turned down. 
Uh, Mr. Westray and Mr. Green, are you now prepared to make these individuals available to us? As I said, Mr. Chairman, that is an issue that uh, Mr. Green and I are not in a position to decide. That's an issue that uh, will go through the chain of command and through the department. We've had this discussion on, uh, on other oversight issues as well. Uh, and there's a, a bit of a debate, I guess, as to the, the uh, level of employee that is automatically made available to, uh, to the oversight committee. And if you make your request, as we've been doing in the past, we will try as best we can, case by case basis, to satisfy your needs. Well, you've got a uh, file of them. Um, and when you say chain of command, I assume you're speaking of the Department of Justice, aren't you? As yes, As well sir. as up through the chain of Yes, uh, in, including the department. I d just for the records, uh, so that it is understood, that we have made these requests on a voluntary basis. Uh, that is, asking the department to voluntarily make these people available. Uh, we have not chosen to resort to other means to compel appearances. Uh, obviously, the, the uh, time that this subcommittee has to sit in its in, under the 101st Congress, which, which ends uh, statutorily on January the 2nd, is very, very brief, and there's not time to do that. It is our hope that it would be done voluntarily. The Congress, um, you know, the three things actually that are, you're sure of, one's death, the other's taxes, and also the third is that there'll be another Congress. And it would be my intent, uh, if we've not gotten some kind of satisfactory resolution, uh, if I'm still in this position, in this chair, to seek that these individuals be brought before this subcommittee. And just, Mr. Westray, something you and I were involved in a previous matter unrelated to this is that eventually we were able to get field agents before the subcommittee. Uh, we worked out an agreement uh, in which the s subcommittee sat in executive session and, and did effectively what were staff interviews, but we still did that. Uh, something along those lines, perhaps, but we are going to, to pursue, this, uh, pursue this matter. Um, Mr. Thomas. I'm deferring the uh, bulk of my questions for executive session. While he's visiting, I might re review my recollection. Now, you've indicated that you indicated that uh, DEA had not used Pan Am from Frankfurt uh, a number of times as part of an undercover operation. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I thought that's what you said. I was just reviewing NBC News had disclosed that you had. <coughs> yes, I believe they named that flight they named the person on the flight and where he went to, and he was in the employee DEA. Not accurate. A key issue, Mr. Green, and uh, uh, since you brought it up again, let me make sure we've got it again uh, even more nailed down. When you say in the employee of DEA, you mean that there was no formal relationship that you would have with a D as you would have with a DEA agent or with an informant who's gone through the regular investigation review, background review process uh, that you've got down in your records as an informant. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. Second part is, I thought I understood your testimony, and I'm asking you to clarify or correct me if I'm wrong. I thought I understood your previous testimony to be that in the case of Mr. Jafar, that your investigation did not show him to be a subsource to any of the informants that you were working with. That is correct. However, you cannot state conclusively. Categorically conclusive. That he was not a subsource. I, I believe your question was, would I state, would, do I know categorically that, uh, my word, that Jafar was not a subsource of anybody? I don't know that. I mean, I can only rely on, we've asked these people. We don't know all subsources, but I go back very important point. Being a subsource, a sub subsource, or anything does not get you aboard an aircraft, does not get you circumventing anybody's uh, uh, airport security, and does not put you as an operative of the DEA. Could subsources, however, is it conceivable that subsources could learn from informants about DEA operating procedures and methods, and thus uh, be able to, to uh, uh, launch their own operations, uh, if you will? Uh, uh, no, there's no, method, there's no method that we would teach, instruct any informant. 
that he could s subsequently teach some subsource of how to circumvent any airport security or uh, any laws of any uh, uh, country in which we work. Mr. Chairman, let's assume that just for discussion that a subsource called up the German police and said, look, I'm working for DEA. I got two kilos in the shoulder bag. I'm en route to New York. The German police wouldn't support something like that. They would call us. We work with them daily. That would be something that just wouldn't happen in the normal context of everyday activities. So there's no way that a subsource uh, could uh, work a controlled delivery the way that we worked, and they've got no way to get into inside of the law enforcement system by themselves. Well, since that subject has come up, Mr. Westray, do uh, I presume that other governments work with DEA on operations? Yes, sir. And it's your Mr. Green's testimony that no control delivery would have taken place through Frankfurt or any place else without the knowledge of the local government. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And so is it possible that the current allegations could stem from the activities of another government's law enforcement agency? Uh, anything, again, is possible but not likely because DEA overseas is the U.S. government representative for, law for drug law enforcement purposes. And so if the FBI or Customs or someone else uh, had this activity underway and they were following our written agreements, uh, that activity would be brokered by the DEA country attache in country. And again, we do this all the time. Uh, if a, one of these other agencies has a source uh, who can, say, do a controlled delivery, it would be done uh, in the foreign countries. The, the liaison out front, the approvals and all that uh, would be handled by the DEA country attache on behalf of the other agency. If you were working an informant, a DEA informant, would you necessarily know whether that informant was also working for another U.S. agency? Well, again, to the extent that you know 100 percent of anything, uh, usually they do not. Occasionally they do. Occasionally we split activities, and in, and in the particular uh, and in particular, where there are terrorism issues and drug issues, um, I know of a number of instances uh, where people have information about uh, certain parts of the world and people, we utilize the person for drug activities and other agencies might be interested in what they have to say uh, for other violations or interests such as terrorism. Uh, that is not an uncommon uh, thing to be sharing someone's capability. And in, in, in closed session, we will tell you how internationally we take steps and there's policies to prevent this double use of uh, sources of information. Mr. Westrate, I think, or perhaps it was Mr. Green, but uh, you challenged the networks to come forward uh, with any evidence or, that they have uh, and with their sources. Yet the DEA has not been willing, at least as of last night, to come forward even with the memo that we requested uh, uh, on your closeout memo on this investigation. I guess I'm in a bit of a quandary uh, why we're not able to get that, to get that memo. I think in fairness, Mr. Chairman, the issue of document disclosure and, and uh, that type of thing gets into issues pertaining to the FBI's investigation of the crash itself. And uh, there are some things interspersed in our documentation that, that uh, probably get too far into that for disclosure in just this context of this hearing. I'm confident that down the road, at the appropriate time, these documents will be made available to the committee, but in the press of time, uh, last night, and considering also that uh, a substantial civil suit or civil uh, uh, paper was filed in New York, which now brings in the aspect of civil litigation, the department, uh, I think, erred on the part or, or decided to go on the, on the uh, conservative side of this. And uh, I think, frankly, that uh, they should be cautious not to jeopardize uh, anything uh, pertaining to prosecution of the case itself, case in chief. And uh, I'm sure there's judgment calls that have been made in that regard. Uh, I'm confident, having attended many meetings on you know, these discussions and debates, that there's certainly nothing being done there to hide things from the committee. They have a sincere and abiding interest in preserving our prosecution posture. And I'm sure you have that interest as well. So I, I would uh, assure you that as we can make these things available, we certainly will. We have no, no reason to hide them in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there's no 
difference in what those papers show uh, from what we've testified to today? I do have that interest. Uh, you and I share that interest. And I think this subcommittee has, particularly with this agency, the DEA, has done everything possible to work in a reasonable manner and not to be overbearing and not to simply request information for information's sake. Uh, I, the best evidence of that is the fact that in just a couple of minutes we're going to close this session and ask a whole bunch of questions that that some of which you think ought to be asked in executive session and some of which I've not even offered to you because I think they ought to be asked in executive session and we don't want to, to um, make your life any more difficult. Having said that, however, I think that the information requested by the subcommittee, particularly in light of public statements made, also in light of the fact that this subcommittee can close and, and seal uh, certain uh, documents as well as it can seal testimony, uh, uh, is, is uh, a failure by the DEA to, to provide and to, to work in that good faith effort. I say that having already acknowledged that there has been, I appreciate very much the good faith effort and the fact that both you gentlemen are present and as I say, Administrator Bonner uh, seems to have an interest in getting this material out in, in public. Uh, Mr. Westray and Mr. Green, is it your, was it, has it always been your understanding from the time that these allegations were first made in October to the time that the, uh, and from the time that the FBI began their investigation, has it always been your understanding that the uh, FBI investigation was uh, inextricably linked to the Pan Am 103 bombing? Or did you at one point at least see them and understand that to be a separate investigation with the results to be announced separately? Well, I think people say this both ways. Uh, I, I don't see how you can separate the two things, but I also think that you can take the conclusions reached as to DEA's involvement in the allegations of DEA's involvement in the bombing and separate them for the purposes of congressional scrutiny uh, and conclusions, and I think that will be done. But it might take, for example, redaction of documents to ensure that things pertaining to <coughs> the investigation of the crash itself are not prematurely disclosed, and that takes some work, it takes a lot of consultation, it takes a tremendous amount of work on the part of the lawyers, and must be carefully done. So uh, I think it's an issue, really, it's a timing question, not so much uh, an issue of whether it was separate or intertwined. Clearly, it can't be completely separated. Mr. Green? I agree with that. Mr. Thomas, any further questions? No, Mr. Thomas, if uh, you have no objections, and at this point I would uh, ask you to ask consent that for the purposes of discussing certain sensitive uh, material and discussing whether it should be, is, is uh, sensitive, that pursuant to Rule 11, Clause 2G, 2A, I hereby move that the subcommittee continue this hearing in executive session in order to determine if the testimony we are about to receive would adversely affect national security interest. Hearing no objections, uh, I, I so uh, declare, and the, there will be a recess for 15 minutes while the room is cleared of those non-approved personnel, and, and, uh, and we will then resume an executive session. <coughs> I believe has the department submitted a list. Yeah, Programming note that C-SPAN will bring you live coverage of a House Armed Services Committee hearing focusing on U.S. policy in the Persian Gulf. Scheduled witnesses include Gene Kirkpatrick, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and Cyrus Vance, former Secretary of State in the Carter Administration. That hearing will air live tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Coming up shortly, a special look at the education system in Japan. Good day from the nation's capital. You're watching...